Hello and welcome to our new webinar, The New Tax Reform Law and How It Impacts You. Today, Naj will share some thoughts and slides covering the new Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, along with the market impact. Thank you, Josh, and hello to all of you out there. Now, the point I want to make behind this slide, I'm not going to go through every single bullet point here, quite simply, is that the Tax Cuts Act was talked about for a very, very long period of time. In fact, if you just go back to the presidential election in 2016, some aspect of a tax reform or tax cut had been talked about and just widely discussed and chewed on. And as we actually got closer to the passage of the bill, you heard it more and more in the media. You heard it talked about a lot more. If you think about taxes, there's one thing that's certain about taxes across the board is that they impact almost everybody. They impact corporations around the world. And so people talk about it a lot. If you believe that markets are efficient discounters of all widely known information, really that's just saying that, well, when people talk about something a lot, markets price that in very quickly. And that same is true for this Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, in our view. So here are some of the highlights of the Tax Cuts and Job Act. For individuals, the top tax rate was decreased to 37% from 39%. The standard deduction was nearly doubled, and the personal exemption was eliminated. And I'll explain the difference between deductions and exemptions here in a moment. For individuals, really, you can think of the, the intent of this, now you can argue whether the intent was actually what happened or not, but you can really think about this as pushing more people into the standard deduction and, and eliminating a lot of the exemptions, a lot of the loopholes that people had before while reducing the overall individual tax rate. On the corporate side of things, they've reduced the tax rate, or the, bill, the act, excuse me, reduced the corporate tax rate from an effective 35% down to about 21%. And likewise, it eliminated the alternative minimum tax. I'll just spend a quick minute on the alternative minimum tax. The alternative minimum tax was removed for corporations, but still exists for individuals. And you can think of the alternative minimum tax as a separate tax regime from the standard system that's really, really just designed to ensure that super wealthy people continue to pay some minimum amount of taxes. And so for certain folks that are over a certain income threshold, they've got to compute their tax situation both the standard way and via AMT and pay the greater of the two, whatever it is. So moving forward, the AMT still exists for individuals. However, some of those limits have changed for them. We can go into specifics in a moment. And for corporations, that's actually been eliminated altogether. So let's take a look at about a little historical perspective for the individual tax rates. What I put on the screen here is the top historical tax rate going back to 1913. And the point I simply want to make here is that by historical standards, this is a very, very small move. Off on the right-hand side of the screen there, you see the move. You compare that in history to past tax moves. Some of you might remember President Ronald Reagan in 1986 swinging the official tax acts, talking about reducing in the top individual tax rate from 50% to 38.5%. That was a pretty big move by comparison on a relative basis to what the move we've seen here today. Now, that also mutes the market impact in a great way. That's not to say that there's no market impact or no personal impact to people, just that by relative standards, this is pretty small and pretty benign overall. From a corporate tax perspective, this also gives you some perspective. What I'll put on the screen here is uh, the corporate tax rates for some of the major industrialized economies across the world, and the red line that you see on your screen is the United States. So that that reduces the overall corporate tax rate for the United States down from 35% to about 21%, and on a relative basis makes it much, much more competitive than before. Now, here's a little bit of a broader perspective. The red bar on the far left of your screen is the United States in the previous tax regime around 35%, and the dotted line is where the U.S. corporate tax rate will be moving forward at 21%. So it should make our corporate tax rate much, much more competitive relative to the past. Now, there's been a lot made to do with the corporate tax rate falling. There's a lot of people who think that, well, won't this boost jobs in a big way? Won't this boost capital spending in a big way? And overall, yes, it may. However, maybe not to the degree that many people think. Ken shared this analogy with, with us and, and clients and sort of jest a long time ago, but I'll, I'll share it with you all here today as well. But what he basically said was, if you think about corporate taxes and you think about the average CEO of a Google or a Microsoft or an Apple, 
and their ability with their CFOs to navigate the global tax scheme and figure out what's best for them. Who do you think is smarter out there in the world, those people or your average politician in Washington? In our view, it's very likely those people in the Apples and Googles of the world being able to navigate the tax scheme to figure out the global tax scheme to figure out what's best for them. So you're unlikely to see, I think, the big, broad, sweeping things. You probably will still see some good come out of tax is overall lower on the corporate basis, but maybe not to the extent that many people think out there in the world. So let's dive into the corporate tax rate in a little bit more detail. As I mentioned earlier, the headline corporate tax rate was reduced from 35 to 21 percent, and the corporate AMT, the alternative minimum tax, was also removed. Importantly, there was another change that was tucked, in, tucked into the Tax Act, and that change allowed some pass-through entities, for example, partnerships or LLCs and sole proprietorships, to claim up to a 20% deduction on their earnings. Now, this is really only for pass-through entities, not for big, broad corporations. They further limited the types of companies that could actually claim these deductions. So for certain service businesses, they might not be able to. Likewise, certain businesses that derived a lot of their income from their reputation or skill or other things out there in the world. So this isn't for everybody. This is very, very nuanced. If you want to find how it might impact your business, I highly recommend that you talk to your tax advisor for it. Now, some of the, some of the other changes on the corporate tax basis, there is a one-time repatri repatriation uh, factor to, in the Tax Act, and repatriated cash will be taxed at a rate of 15.5%. Illiquid overseas assets will be taxed at a rate of 8%. Likewise, the United States, for the first time ever, is in fact adopting a territorial tax system. In the past, the United States had what was called a worldwide tax system. So for U.S. corporations that were headquartered in the United States, the United States government would try to tax really any profits derived or revenues derived anywhere across the world for that company. The United States was actually one of, the, one of the last big OECD countries out there in the world with a worldwide tax system. Most of the rest of the developed economies around the world actually have adopted a territorial system. There's only six countries left with the worldwide system, most of them not big industrialized company, countries. So in a lot of ways, this territorial system will benefit corporations in a pretty big way. Now, another measure that was included in the Tax Act was the Base Erosion Anti-Abuse Tax, the BEAT uh, amendment. You can just think about this simply as being an alternative AMT. This is really designed for very, very big corporations with gross receipts over $500 million in the past three calendar years. And the idea here is that they, the Congress did not want these big corporations hiding any of their revenues overseas or using their foreign entities to hide what would otherwise be considered part of their US, U.S. tax base. So this is really, really targeting those super, super big companies out there in the world and is an alternative measure to the AMT, which is eliminated for large corporations overall. Now, switching gears to individuals. I want to just point out a couple of things to you here. There's a lot of different changes in the Tax Act, and it's important to think holistically about your personal financial situation, the tax changes that you've seen today, and how they're going to impact you. Because what you may have done in the past may not be what you want to do in the future. It's also important to separate tax decisions from investment decisions. As I mentioned earlier, the tax change will impact various taxpayers differently depending on your unique financial situation. So it is important to talk to your individual tax advisor and nothing that we say here today is to be construed as tax advice. This is just general information for you to better understand the Tax Act. Next, I want to share with you a little bit of the individual tax framework. Taxes can be a, a very complicated thing, so I've generalized here a little bit just to help you understand some of the moving pieces of the Tax Act. So we all know generally what income is. Income can be from uh, uh, employment, it can be from Social Security, it can be from rental income, from other sources as well. Income generally is defined as that, but then you have your adjusted gross income. Your adjusted gross income factors out things like contributions to a 401k or an IRA or a health savings account. It's really things that shouldn't be considered in your tax picture overall. When you look at your adjusted gross income, under the normal tax routine or, or standard, you have two factors that can actually reduce your adjusted gross income to get your taxable income. 
The first is exemptions, and the second is deductions. As I mentioned earlier, the personal exemption was actually eliminated into the new tax act. So previously, you were able to deduct a certain amount, which I'll cover here in a moment, for yourself, if you were married, for your spouse as well. And if you had kids, likewise for your kids. And that reduced your overall adjusted gross income to get your taxable income. Secondarily, you've got deductions, and these come in two flavors. You've got your standard deduction, which is just a certain amount that you might take. Now, a lot of people out there in the world just take the standard deduction because it's quite a lot of work to actually go and itemize your deductions. Going the itemizing route of your deductions actually involves you actually listing out all of the different expenses that you might have, whether it be charitable contributions or miscellaneous income. And so those are the two types of deductions out there in the world, and I'll explain how those have changed here in 2018. Now, after you take your adjusted gross income and reduce it by your exemptions and your deductions, what you get is your taxable income. You take your taxable income and multiply by your effective tax rate, and you get really what you owe in taxes to the federal government. Now, you can offset the taxes that you owe to the federal government by what's called tax credits. An example of a tax credit is a child tax credit. And tax credit just simply completely reduces the amount that you owe to the federal government. So you can see how exemptions and deductions impact your adjusted gross income, but tax credits actually are, are more impactful on reducing the overall tax amount that you owe. And if you have credits, in a lot of cases, that can actually be refundable to you over if you don't owe any money in taxes or if the amount of credits that you have exceeds the amount that you owe in taxes overall. So now that you understand that basic framework for the standard way of computing taxes, mind you, the AMT method is slightly different and eliminates a lot of things like exemptions, inductions, and credits. But now that you know this, we can dive into some more, more of the details of the Tax Act. So some of the details here, most of the individual income tax cuts start in 2018, so they're not effective for the 2017 calendar year. But next year, when you file your taxes for 2018, and they reset in 2026. Now, the reason for this reset in 2026 is actually something called the Byrd Rule in the Senate, which really limits Congress's ability to pass legislation that has a deficit impact beyond 10 years. And so a lot of these individual income tax cuts reset in 2026 and go back to their 2017 levels thereafter. Medical expense limits were lowered in 2017 as well, as I'll, as I'll cover here in a moment. And then a few very low-impact business deductions likewise changed. So here we have a look at the individual tax brackets for single filers and married filers filing jointly. <clears throat> and what you want to take away from this is tax rates for most people in the new act are lower. Let's just take a look at two examples. Let's take an example of a single filer making $150,000 in 2017, a single filer making $150,000 in 2017 would fall into the 28% tax bracket. That same single filer in 2018, still making $150,000, will fall into the 24% tax bracket. Let's move over to the married filing jointly. Let's just again assume they're making about $150,000. In 2017, under that tax regime, they'd be paying about 25%. In 2018, that same couple will actually only be paying about 22%. And that's really across the board. Taxes rates for most people are lower, but that's not always the case. There are some instances where some folks may have actually been pushed into a higher tax bracket because of where Congress drew these lines for these new tax brackets. Now, as I mentioned earlier, personal exemptions were eliminated. And here's just an example of personal exemptions in 2017 versus 2018. As I mentioned earlier, you could actually take an exemption for yourself, and that amount in 2017 was $4,050. If you had a spouse, you just doubled it. And if you had two dependents, likewise, you quadrupled that personal exemption. So this was the amount that you could deduct from your adjusted gross income overall. In 2018, these have all been eliminated. However, after eliminating these, what Congress has tried to do is offset them by doubling the standard deduction, which is, which is what I'm showing on your screen here. The standard deduction for married individuals filing jointly has been doubled, nearly doubled to $24,000 from $12,700, and from head of household filers to $18,000 from about $9,000, and for single filers to $12,000 from $6,300 or so. Again, this is really to try to offset eliminating the personal exemption and then closing some other loopholes that we had earlier. 
They've also increased the child tax credit, which I'll mention, which I'll show you here in a moment. Another factor that was widely discussed in the news media and in the run-up to the passage of the Tax Act was, in fact, the state and local tax deduction. The, under the new tax law, state and local tax deductions and property taxes are capped at $10,000. Previously, there was no cap. So if you take a look at this hypothetical example here in 2017, if an individual had property taxes of about $9,000 and a state income tax of about $11,000, they could deduct $20,000 from their adjusted gross income. Under the new tax law in 2018, that amount is capped at just $10,000. Another change was the mortgage interest deduction. Under the new law, mortgage interest deductions are capped at $750,000 in new mortgage debt. That's down from about a million dollars in 2017. Now remember, that's only new mortgage debt. If you already have mortgage debt, that's simply grandfathered in, and the deductibility of which is simply grandfathered in. So this is really anything from 2018 on that's capped at $750,000 or the interest on that $750,000 mortgage. Likewise, the new law eliminates the deduction of $100,000 in additional home equity debt. So if you have a home equity line of credit or that sort of thing, a second mortgage on your home, this now eliminates the ability to deduct that, the interest on that loan. Now here's another one that's been widely discussed and a lot of people, a lot of our clients have questions about, but it's also the deduction or the elimination of miscellaneous itemized deductions. So miscellaneous itemized deductions are things like unreimbursed employee expenses, union dues, legal fees, tax preparation fees, and in fact investment management fees. So to take a look at exactly how this impacts different people, let's go into some more of the details here. Now, first of all, to actually take any of these itemized deductions, you actually had to itemize your taxes. If you aren't itemizing and you're just taking the standard deduction, this really didn't impact you at all in the past. Likewise, you have to remember that with the increase of the standard deduction, far fewer people out there in the world are actually going to be itemizing today. So that's something to keep in mind. Likewise, it's important to remember that the, in order to be able to deduct your itemized deductions, it had to exceed 2% of your AGI, or adjusted gross income, and only the amount over that 2% of AGI was deductible. So let's just take a look at how that might impact a, a hypothetical couple filing jointly. Say this couple in 2017 had an AGI of $150,000. The miscellaneous itemized deductions were about $18,500, $18,000 in investment management fees and $500 in tax preparation fees. Their deductible amount in 2017 would have been $15,500 when you consider that 2% floor of AGI. The standard deduction in 2017 was $12,700. So just based on this simple look that's only looking at the investment management fees and miscellaneous itemized deductions, it would make more sense for this couple to itemize their deductions in 2017, leaving them with a taxable income of $134,500. In 2018, by contrast, that same couple making about $150,000, you've eliminated the miscellaneous itemized deductions, therefore there isn't a deductible amount for that, but you've doubled the standard deduction. Now, it makes much more sense for them just to take the standard deduction. Of course, this isn't considering any other type of itemized deductions they may have, but you'll see that their taxable income in 2018 under the new tax law is actually much, much lower relative to where it was in 2017. So this is just one example to illustrate the impact of these kind of closing the itemized deductions but increasing the standard deduction overall. So some of the other changes and as they impact people out there in the world, charitable deductions are increased to 60% of adjusted gross income and are now deductible from 50%. Likewise, medical expenses exceeding 7.5% of adjusted gross income are now deductible in 2017 and 2018 relative to the 10% that it was before. Now, this reverts back to 10%, however, in the 2019 tax year. Some other changes are the estate tax exemption, which has been doubled now to $22.4 million for couples. And likewise, as I mentioned earlier, partially to offset the elimination of the personal exemptions, 
Congress's Enhance the Child Tax Credit, doubling it from $1,000 per child to $2,000, likewise increasing the amount that's fully refundable to $1,400. So if you don't owe the government any money or you have more credits than you owe the government, the government will refund you actually $1,400 of that child tax credit back to you. There's also a $500 non-refundable credit for non-child dependents. So if you're taking care of someone who isn't your own child, say an elderly parent or someone else, you're provided a $500 credit. However, that is not refundable. So let's switch gears here a little bit now and talk about the impact of tax changes. And as I mentioned earlier, if you believe that markets are efficient discounters of all widely known information and tax changes impact everybody, so they're very, very widely discussed, they in fact don't move markets very much. Markets just simply have a lot of time to price in and chew on tax legislation before it actually passes. So it doesn't have very much surprise power over markets. But then too, remember that taxes, especially just tax changes in one country, even a country as big as the United States, are just one of myriad drivers impacting global stocks. There are just so many other things out there in the world, fundamental factors, economic factors, political factors, and sentiment factors that really impact global stocks. You've got to take these changes and scale them relative to everything else that's going on in the world. And I'll show you one way to do that here in a moment. But one of the things that people very commonly think about is, well, tax cuts are clearly good. Shouldn't that be a good thing for stocks? And tax hikes are clearly bad. Shouldn't that be a bad thing for stocks? I wanted to share with you this quote from Ken's October 2017 USA Today article when tax reform was still being widely discussed. He said, when the tax talk and whacker jack adjustments are finished, the real drivers of this bull market come into clearer focus. Then stocks will likely keep charging higher as they usually have after a tax reform. Be bullish about increased clarity, not possible tax cuts. Now, of course, those tax cuts did come to pass, but Ken's point here is still perfectly true, which is simply that the real drivers are going to come into clearer focus. And although we've seen stocks be volatile here a little bit, and you've had a correction very recently here this year, most of that is tied to false fears. And in our view, a lot of the tax cuts, things that have happened, have been quickly priced into markets and don't have any of that surprise power. Let me show you a different way of looking at the fact that when, in fact, people think tax cuts are automatically good and tax hikes are automatically bad, there's simply no data to corroborate that. What I'll put on the screen here is tax cuts going back to the 1920s. And the S&P 500 returns also before the tax cut actually was enacted, but then afterwards as well. And the reason I'm putting before and after is that you can see if there was actually some big swing or some big change from what stocks were doing before to what they were doing after, and if the tax cut did indeed have an impact. What you see is on average, in the 12 months leading up to a tax cut, stocks return nearly 10%. But in the 12 months after a tax cut, stocks really were only up about 4.1% on average. And of course, there are various instances where that differs in history, but on average, this is true. They just simply don't have big, robust power to push stocks forward thereafter. By contrast, when you look at tax hikes, again, this is tax hikes going back to the 1926 and taking a look at the S&P 500 returns over that same time period, tax, hack, tax hikes, excuse me, perversely, 12 months after them, stocks are up about 11%. So tax hikes or cuts are simply not predictive. The thing to take away from them, whether it's corporate taxes, personal taxes, or even capital gains taxes, they simply don't have predictive power over stocks at all because they're so widely discussed before they're implemented, they just simply lose a lot of their surprise power. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's also important to think globally when it comes to taxes. What I put on the screen here is the global gross domestic product. And while the United States is a very, very big part of the world, it really only makes up a hair under 25% of the global economy. So a tax cut that, in fact, was relatively minor on the personal income tax side, maybe a little bit bigger on the corporate tax side, really doesn't have big, broad, sweeping power over the entire global economy, which is what drives global stocks overall. It may have some small impact in the United States, but you have to really think globally about these things, and they just don't have the power overall to impact the global economy in a pretty big way. Now, I'd be remiss not to leave you with this. As I mentioned earlier, 
all of the information that we're sharing here with, with you today is really just educational in nature. We want to help you understand the nature of these tax cuts and how they impact both people and corporations. And it's important to talk to your tax advisor to understand how they impact your personal financial situation. Great. Thank you so much, Naj. And that's all that we do have time for today. Um, thank you so very much for joining us for today's tax reform webinar. Thank you.